I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the IFF's kitchen table, uh, another addition to address uh, some of the issues that are critically important to our union, uh, our members, and for this show, uh, our local union and affiliate uh, leadership. Uh, we're here in Los Angeles at the, uh, our ALTS Affiliate Leadership Training Summit, uh, and today with a uh, audience of new leaders from across the uh, United States and Canada, uh, we've been discussing uh, all of the programs and services and divisions and departments of the IAFF. But to, right now we wanna be able to engage some leadership and have a discussion and see if we can put it into to real terms, how it works in, in real terms and real life uh, out in the field with the challenges that everyone here and all of you uh, out there I know are are facing uh, each and every day. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Amy Burden from Leland, North Carolina, a local 5160, and uh, Leland hails from Eastern uh, North Carolina uh, and currently serves as a battalion chief for the town of Leland Fire and Rescue Department. Uh, she was monumental in forming her local union, which I have some experience uh, from a long time ago with and know the challenges in a right-to-work state and in a state where collective bargaining is prohibited, but yet still union membership can, can thrive and currently serving as the local's president. Uh, to my far left, we have Ty Bailey from Sacramento Local 522, and Ty began his career actually in, with the United States Forest Service uh, and then uh, went on the job with uh, CAL FIRE originally and then over to uh, Sacramento, and for the uh, last 16 years, working on the Sacramento Fire Department, uh, serving as a captain since 2011. Starting in 2003, though, uh, he has served on a number of the committees and negotiating teams for the local, served as uh, vice president uh, in 2011, and is in his second year serving as President of, of Local uh, 522, uh, welcome to you, Ty. Thank you. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Aaron Mitchler from New Orleans, Local uh, 632, a 21-year veteran of the New, New Orleans Fire Department, uh, promoting to the rank of captain during the uh, Hurricane Katrina and all of the challenges uh, that the local and our members uh, faced during that uh, uh, horrific uh, storm and disaster. Um, he's been a, a strong and active union member uh, ever since joining the fire department and in 2016 stepped up to the plate and elected as president of New, Lo New Orleans uh, Local 632. They represent over 1,250 members um, and I know he's got a strong team with John and Rick on your team uh, and uh, I'll be interested to hear him share some of his challenges with you. And uh, to my far right, Rob Weeks from Vancouver Local 18. And Rob has been on the executive board of uh, Local 18 since 2009, and elected as uh, Local's president in 2014, uh, representing over 800 members uh, in uh, Vancouver. He's also an executive vice president of the British Columbia uh, Firefighters Association. Uh, Professional Firefighters Association, the State Council there in, in British Columbia Province, as well as serving as one of our district uh, field service representatives uh, in the 6th District. Uh, well, welcome, Rod. And I should Thank have you. mentioned with Ty uh, representing, uh, what, a little over 2,000 members in your local. So we have a nice mix of locals here, and really what I'd like to do is ask each of you maybe to to share um, you know, some of your experiences, challenges, successes, and uh, how the IFF may ha have been uh, a benefit to you. So Amy, I'm gonna throw it to you first. So the IFF to me is fairly new. Um, I'm a first generation firefighter. Um, I came to Leland a little over three years ago and they did not have a local. Um, some neighboring counties in North Carolina did. Um, and I just started researching and I thought, you know, this is something that can benefit. So um, I reached out to the local DVP for the state of North Carolina, who happens to work with me as well. And um, we started 
uh, one year ago, forming our local. Um, we're a small department, and we have over 60% membership of career, full, or career time employees right now. Um, we just worked through starting, uh, worked work with you guys about our bylaws, and then in September of this past year, well, Florence came. And um, that was a big knock for us, for our small department. It came on shore about 10 minutes from where we were, um, shut us down completely. And um, before it ever started, Mark from your office reached out. He said, hey, I'm going to give you some help from Colorado. They're going to run your social media pages and keep your citizens updated about what's going on if family needs to find out where you're at. And from there, it was just completely overwhelming. Um, we got help from the guys from Prince George came. You guys came down. Um, our DVP, Walt Dix, is an amazing man. Um, I speak with him on a weekly basis just about all the time. Um, Tom Brewer is our state president from North Carolina. His team reached out to us about every three days, probably. Um, we had some members with some extensive damages in their homes, and they were displaced. And the heart team from New York came in and did some demolition. Um, all of our members, except for one, are back in their homes. Um, it's just amazing. I remember when you came and did our station visit, um, what you said that stuck out to me was, uh, you don't owe me a thank you, this is what you pay your dues for. And the biggest question in recruiting for us is, I don't want to be, we're, in, we're in a non-union state, why am I going to pay you dues? Well, Florence was bittersweet. It doubled our membership. You guys came in, um, vaccinations, resources, peer support, and it kind of just spoke for itself. Um, and since then, we've just catapulted in our membership. And um, even today, we've had people reach out, is there anything else we can do for your membership to make sure you're functioning well so you can continue to do your job? So that was our biggest uh, challenge so far with nine months brand new into the IFF. And um, it kind of speaks for itself. Well, job well done and, uh, and obviously welcome. And it doesn't matter whether, again, I said earlier this morning, we don't have large locals, we don't have small locals, we have locals, because every member, every one of your members pays the same freight as they do in some of our very largest locals uh, in North America. And I know the challenges you face in a, in a right to work state, but still finding the value uh, of the IFF and being unionized. Let me, uh, Ty, uh, turn to you and uh, share some of your thoughts, experiences, challenges, and uh, how the IFF may uh, uh, been a, a value. So I served six years as a VP, and so I had a little bit of an understanding when I got elected as president. And by utilizing our 10th district vice president, Lima, and the IFF, I learned very quickly that there's a lot of resources that are available that can streamline much of our processes, including when we had two mergers from other units that came into our bargaining group last year, we needed to make sure we're following the bylaws and doing everything correctly. And by reaching out to the IFF, they were able to assist us in that. Uh, also, I've, in this last eight months, we've been working with fire EMS operations on the standards of coverage, the GIS program, behavioral health, doing the CAFRS reports, the comps. And so we're really utilizing those resources to streamline it, make sure that we're getting the most for our members. Tell a little bit about the local, knowing that it is one of our amalgamated locals so that the audience yeah. has a better sense of that it's not just 2,000 members, yeah. but it's a pretty complex uh, it is. local union. Um, so we have eight departments in our union. We, we cover three counties, uh, Yolo County, Sacramento County, and Placer County. Uh, it's completely drop boundary, so it's you don't have to request for any automatic or mutual aid. It's closest apparatus or equipment goes, which makes it even more complex when you look at a standard of coverage because you could literally be in Yolo County and running a call all the way up to El Dorado County, which is the border of the county county line. Which what kind of runtime is that for? The, the that would be extreme, but I mean, typically we try, you know, we want to get there in four minutes, but the second alarm could be up to 12 to 15 minutes for response times in the rural areas. And obviously it's 
We have a, a very high wildland area and urban interface with the city of Sacramento and the outer county areas, so there's also that complex issue that we, that we deal with with our membership. Um, and so it, it has its challenges because of the fact that you have eight departments, 10 contracts, and by going what I call now the tri-county with the three counties, it's really opened up our political action because we're not only in Sacramento County, but now we can fight in Yolo County and in Placer County. And that goes all the way up to the Senate level. Uh, right now we have a special election in District 1, for instance. And so uh, it's very diverse. Very good. Rob, tell us about uh, Vancouver and your operations and uh, challenges, opportunities, and the IFF's potential role as you've been leading the local. Yeah, well, as you know, we're a, a Canadian charter local, actually the only Canadian charter local, the IFF. And when I stepped into the role, um, our membership was incredibly proud to be part of that organization, but I didn't truly understand what it meant to be a part of that until I took uh, the role as president and uh, led my local through some really troubling times. Uh, when I took over as president, we uh, had a history of, of really deep uh, labor relations struggles and staffing cuts. Uh, that's despite our city, which is a world-class city, Vancouver, Canada, that, that had grown immensely. It had doubled in population over the last few decades, and our risk would at least quadrupled, but yet we'd seen significant staffing cuts. Uh, we faced nine significant contractual arbitrations in my first three years as president. And I, my team couldn't have got through that without the support of the IFF. Uh, our DVP at first it was Lauren West, followed by uh, Mike Hurley, who's now the mayor of Burnie, Burnaby. A shameless plug to, to Mike. Congratulations. Oh, it's a, it's a great so, success yes, story. Uh, We're so proud of Mike. Yeah, but uh, using uh, Sean McManus's from the Canadian legal side and uh, Scotty Marks and his team in the Canadian office were instrumental in helping us uh, right that ship as far as labor relations. On the staffing side, we just really uh, absorbed everything the IFF was instructing uh, us to do as a local, uh, to be really engaged politically, to engage your politicians, to engage the public, uh, to brand your local, to make sure that you are the champions and the voice for public safety. And we followed that template and it was difficult, but we stuck, stayed the course with the advice of the IFF. We're using resources from uh, Lori Moore's office, from uh, Mark uh, Triglio's office, and uh, we use those tools to our advantage. And I can proudly say now that we've just had a city council that's passed a budget giving us 122 more firefighters over the next five years. Oh, that's great and work. So it's, that's yeah. great work. Good work. What are you, uh, how are you staffing? Since you mentioned staff and you're getting to some more uh, firefighters, what is, your, how, what is your staffing right now on your department as far as uh, on your rigs or by ship? Well, we, right now we have 137 firefighters on duty 24-7, and we're going to be bumped up to uh, 20 more, so 157. And we're celebrating that, but, uh, you know, the, the better the irony there, that only brings us back to our staffing levels in the mid-80s. So we still have a long way to go, but we're still uh, uh, celebrating that. But what our push is now is to ensure that we're 1710 compliant. And so you mentioned the resources. So I'm going to assume, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, some of the... Uh, a GIS and uh, 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 exhibits, uh, uh, technical assistant exhibits prepared by the IFF for you. You utilize yeah. those in making your, uh, your argument, justifying your position? Absolutely. We, uh, our department initially had done a study uh, calling for cuts to our department, and we took that study on with the help of the IFF technical team. Uh, as well, we got a GIS study done uh, that uh, really solidified for us our arguments about requiring more staffing in a really dense city, a high risk, lots of high rises, and uh, you know, within changes to 1710, acknowledging medium and high hazard, that was significant for us, and it really applied to our city. And we could show our decision makers uh, with a really a, a beautiful report that you know, there was a need, and there still is a need. Uh, and Aaron, I'm going to come to you. I know your city well. <laughs> you do? And, yeah, you've been uh, down there. Why don't you uh, share with our, our audience uh, kind of the story of New Orleans uh, under yeah. your leadership, uh, challenges? There, there, was, there was many challenges. Uh, we took over our local. It was uh, in disarray when, when we came into office. Uh, me, my vice president, Rick, and my uh, secretary, uh, treasurer, John, we decided to, to run as a, as a team because 
we had a lot of house cleaning to do uh, inside our local. We were being beat down by uh, mayor and city administration for eight years. Uh, we went 11 years without a pay raise. Uh, we're still eight years without a, a collective bargaining agreement, which we're beginning the, the negotiations of right now. But when we came into office, we had so many challenges that uh, we really didn't know enough to know what we didn't know. And we didn't know who to ask, when to ask. And we actually, when we won our election, we walked into the office and what now? You know? <laughs> and our first phone call, uh, the first phone call I got was from General Secretary Edzo, reached out and said, whatever we need, you know, don't hesitate to call. And next call was from our DVP, Danny Todd, who I can't say enough for having him as, as a DVP. He's helped out immensely. And we were brought up to Washington, had a, a, you know, a little meet and greet with ev all the different uh, departments and everybody that we talked to, you know, take a call, you need anything, you call. And I said, you know, be careful what you ask for because I'm not scared to pick up a phone. And they've been true to their word and I've been true to mine. And I could run down a list of everyone that uh, has helped out uh, we were doing a pay study, uh, my, my Vice President Rick and I, we, we spent six weeks plugging away at it on our own, finding, you know, going on the internet, finding all this information. And when we had our, our meeting with Lori and Kelly Lopez, who is a saint, uh, all, the, all the work that we did, they brought back to us plus more within two minutes. So that was six weeks of spinning our wheels that we, we could have done something different. Uh, Mark Treglio, Scott Tribitz with the communications division, they've helped out getting, you know, helping me out getting our brand out. We, we rebranded uh, our local and just the work that they've done with us has been astounding. And things are beginning to turn around in the city uh, with the pay study. We've recently got a 10% raise. Uh, we're working on another 15% over the next two years. Uh, like I said, we're in negotiations for a, a contract. Uh, we're in the beginning stages of that. But things are beginning to turn around, and I owe it all you know, to our general president, who's been there behind us the whole way. Well, we spent a little time in New Orleans together. Yes. And uh, had to deal with a couple of mayors. Um, and now I think you're maybe in a situation where we've got a mayor in there that's willing to work with you. We do. She, she reached out. Uh, and one thing I can say is the staff of the IAFF is one thing. You can reach out to any of them at any time and they'll be there to help. But a, a, a resource people really don't think about is the people sitting next to you, behind you, other leaders of other locals. Uh, our first official meeting with our mayor was actually instituted. Uh, my vice president and I went up to Boston for the uh, Council of Mayors while they did the fire ops because we were planning on doing a fire ops and we wanted to learn a few things. So Matt Vinci brought us up. Uh, our mayor was going to be there. She didn't participate at that time, but Ryan Moody, who's the president of Tacoma, his mayor was there also. And our two mayors became friends. And she actually instituted our first meeting with our mayor in Boston. Uh, over drinks, which wasn't so bad. We got a lot of, a lot of work done uh, unofficially, but it, it went a long way. So utilize uh, the networking that you have in this local. It, it, it's huge. I've, I've had help from DVP Frankie Lima, who, who you know, our mayor is friends with uh, Mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles. And you know, it's just things you don't think about that you, know, you reach out to somebody, it's happening somewhere else. It's not just happening in your uh, municipality, there's other places uh, that same things are going on and bend the ear of the people around you and you'll get an answer. Well, you know, one of the, uh, one of the areas that, you know, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on is our work in the, in the political arena. Um, and uh, as our GST said this morning, and I've been saying for a long, long time, you know, Everything really comes out of that arena. That's where all the power is. That's where all the decision makers come from. So with that said, how about each of you sharing any experience and how you have potentially uh, utilized uh, the political uh, operation and process as part of advancing you know, your own uh, 
your own efforts. So I'll, I'll, Rob, throw it to you first. Well, it's been a critical part of our success, and, and we've, uh, we've just immersed ourselves in what the IFF offers, and I completely agree with Aaron that it, it, you call anyone from the IFF staff, they're more than willing to help. And, uh, and then on top of that, I think we, all of the new leaders need to be mindful of uh, the great opportunity uh, something like this is ALTS. Uh, you know, so we learned from going into courses at ALTS that the IFF was putting on really how best to, to engage our political leaders. And certainly from you, General President, that's always been your mantra to make sure you're in, involved in that game. So we uh, use the, the training opportunities at ALTS. We've sent uh, uh, members of our team to the Political Training Academy. And uh, also from the communication strategy point of view, we followed those templates, bringing up uh, public safety messages, using the toolkit provided by the communications division, following a strategic communications plan that ensures that we are the voice for public safety so that when we call on our public to, uh, to support us uh, in our decisions about uh, our political leaders, that they're behind us. And so I can't say enough about uh, what the IFF has provided, but the best place to start is, is something like this, this affiliate leadership training course where you can really start to get the roadmap on how you can, can do that and engage your political leaders. Ty? I remember my first convention I went to was in Philly. And for those of you who were there, I remember walking down the street with you leading the charge to the, to the uh, city hall to rally against their mayor, who I believe was their mayor at the time. Nutter. And uh, the hair on my neck went up and I saw the power of political action and being part of the IFF. And I know from my experience, the assistance that we've gotten from the IFF for our political action has been huge. When I first got elected, the economy was down, our membership was down. I think our PAC fund had around 200,000. And um, I know through Brian Rice's leadership, DVP Lima, yourself, Right now, I can say we have over 750,000 in our PAC account. And, you know, money is power. And our membership has seen what we can do by getting out there and busting our butts for them. So. Amy, I know new local and, uh, and know the region you come from. But how about uh, in, any experience in, in that political arena yet? And to what extent have it been a benefit? So my experience is uh, minimal, but we took several trips to our state capitol in Raleigh last year, and um, through the direction of our state leaders, that, which was in turn through the direction of IFF, we had got presumpt presumptive cancer legislation passed, um, and that was huge for us. Um, and it was all just talking points, again, based off of what you said, the templates, and the way we're you know, instructed just as easy as forming a meeting, sitting down and having a meeting and getting that face-to-face -face out there and learning, you know, so advancing presumption, so advance cancer presumption in an anti-union, yes. non-collective bargaining state environment by utilizing our political yes. tools and strategies. Now, our relationship in Raleigh is strong. Um, our leaders on the state level are there weekly. I feel like um, we are a name. They know who we are when we walk in the door. They make time for us. They kick everybody else out of the way, which is kind of neat to see. Uh, we walk in the building, they stop what they're doing to hear what we have to say. It doesn't always work out in our favor, but um, that's not a bad thing either because they continue to listen to what we have to say, uh, which is very encouraging, especially in a non-union state. Very good. And Aaron, politics uh, in New Orleans. Politics in New Orleans. You got more mayors in jail than you do in office. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We definitely, we definitely oh, my do. God. <laughs> It'd be, it wouldn't be as funny if it wasn't true. You know? <laughs> but uh, as far as political action, we have to kind of walk a fine line uh, dealing with the Hatch Act in Louisiana. Uh, I'm working with our council, uh, Louis Robin, who is kind of, we're kind of getting around corners and, and, and doing things where we can actually put our foot in, in that now, I door. I think it's important for the audience, really, because you think of New Orleans, a big city, you know, a, a famous city, but um, unfortunately, or, or not, I, I think it would be of interest to w what you have to work under as far as the inability or ability to engage in political action. Right. Um, with that, being able to, we're, we're not allowed to take, uh, under the Hatch Act, we're not allowed to partake in any political activity uh, at all. 
but as officers of the union, left up to interpretation, uh, which is why we're working with counsel, you can, as an officer of the union, have certain guidelines that you can follow to do that. And away from the monetary uh, side of, of working with that, when we engage our politicians, we kind of use the firefighter brand. That's, that's what we have. We have our reputation in the neighborhoods, in the streets, in the community. And that's something that we can lend to them that I believe is, is more valuable than any money that we could donate to that campaign. So we use that uh, as monetary uh, value to them. So you've built your brand and you use your brand to use, use the your brand. influence, even though you may not be able to make it. <coughs> A, a direct a formal, contribution. Direct contribution, right. financial contribution. Right. Um, we have a, the audience here. I, wanna, I, I see we have a sister at the mic. Hi, Jamie Wallace with the Prescott Fire Department, Local 3066. We just had a really great success, too, of passing a tax reform with you all's help, so I want to say thank you for that. And I can relate to your story of we've been able to make up a little bit of ground of having maybe an eight year freeze on wages and benefit decreases, but we want to ask for some more. So I want to ask questions about your tactics for going back in another couple of years and asking for 15% more, or if you have good strategies for success in that regard. You know, we got a little bit, but we want to ask again, you know, right. about to not be. It, it's, it's a hard ask when, when you've just gotten a raise to, to we actually went in and our, our initial ask was a 25% raise. And what we used to come up with that number was we put a parity study, a lot like Houston is going through right now. We did a parity study with our police. Uh, the city hired a, a third party agency to come in and do a study on, on city finance and city uh, salaries. And we took the cities that they used and I went back and instead of just comparing apples to apples, fire department to fire department, I went in and looked, what do the police make in these cities? And what do the firefighters make in these cities? And based on those numbers, we came up with an average of 9.8% pay parity between police and fire. And we were 45% behind our police. So we used that as the benchmark, the base for where, what we were asking for, just to bring us within that average. And when we brought that to them, they looked at it and said, yeah, this is unfair. Uh, there's no way with the finances the way they were to give it to us all at once. So we, we offered them, we were like, we're not asking you to do it all at once. We get, we've given you the number where we need to be. Tell us how to get there. We'll, we'll help, just tell us how to get there. And they, they came along so far, they're, they're holding their end of the bargain. You know. You mind if I add No, Ty, please, I want everybody to jump in. I would just recommend we can utilize the IFF for the, the parity studies, but it's important for us to do our job and make sure they have all the correct information so that when we're doing those comps, we have the wages and benefits that all the other agencies are gonna use to compare you have. Um, so I just I absolutely recommend all of us are doing that and updating those MOUs every year. I know it's a lot of work, but it's gonna pay off dividends for our members, for everyone. It helps everyone out, helping it, you know. So. Um, sister, at the mic. Good morning, Jennifer Schaefer, Local 215, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. With the always changing membership, what, how do you recommend you bridge the gap from the new generations being hired to the veterans that have always run the, our membership? Well, I'm going to see what each, how each are handling it. I, I would just start off by saying that, you know, we spend a lot of effort and time in our communication shop to, uh, make sure that we are not only ourselves utilizing, but also helping to instruct how we communicate with today's generation. And to make sure that we're not stuck in old models, um, but to utilize all of the various platforms where we know our younger generations want to receive and get their information. So, as the international, uh, if you will, we're certainly spending a lot of time in developing and evolving those communication tools. And we try to push those out through a number of uh, venues, including here at ALTS, but also through our Communication Training Academy, 
But with that, I'll throw it and uh, see how each of our panelists would, would answer that question, communicating to the next generation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the older generation. I'll just go right sure. to left. Well, right. I don't, I'll, I can start and say that I remember sitting at an alts course, um, and I think it was Scott Trebet, Scott Trebet, uh doing the instruction, talking about engaging your new generation of, of union members. And at that time, our only communication was uh, through hard mail, uh, the odd email, and some bulletin boards. And uh, we've come a long way from, from that spot. Now we're uh, very engaged on social media with our members. We make sure that we communicate uh, to our members in the best way they want to get information. And we've really used the tools uh, that the IFF has provided and advice they've given us to make sure that we engage those new union leaders, including, like, you know, we're talking about branding our, and I totally agree with you, our brand is so powerful and it's powerful with political leaders and it's powerful with the public, but it's also powerful that we, we it's important that we make sure our brand is strong within and uh, we make sure that our members, our new members, are really aware of that strength and, you know, verbiage like it's our union, not the union, we're, we're really diligent about that and that's really helped us, but certainly, being uh, listening to that alts course maybe nine years ago now, ten years ago, that said you need to get on this wave, new wave of communication, and we heeded that advice and have done it, and that's really helped us engage our, our new members. Amy? The mighty tool of Facebook. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and everyone Amy. Facebooks, everyone Twitters, everyone whatever social media platform you may have um, at our local, excuse me. Um, it's bridging the gap in the two different sides of the house, the EMS side of the house and the fire side of the house. Um, but it's just getting the word out, updating weekly, sending out newsletters weekly that everyone can uh, feel like they're a part of what's going on and knowing what's going on in our local, what we're looking for um, or what we're doing, how we're um, spending our money that they pay their dues for every, every month. That's important. Um, there's been a little bit of a divide, especially pulling in the EMS crowd, which is a large amount of our membership. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of movement with that, but we need to work a little bit harder. Uh, there definitely is a gap between the older side of our membership and the younger side. Even for me, um, I'm a new, younger leader, but um, the importance is bringing the traditional aspect of it to our brand new employees who may not understand that part of what it's about because tradition is just as important as our new ideas as well, just a, a blend of those things. Aaron? Um, we benefit from a, a large participation from our retired members who remain in, in our membership uh, even after they retire. And we partner with our veterans associations uh, to get the word out. Uh, we have a lot of help from those guys to, to bridge that gap. And we, we brought on a firefighter who's uh, increased our digital footprint and he, he spans all the social medias. He does our email blasts. And like I said, we have the, the help of the Veterans Association, and they're vocal. They're, they're some of our most vocal members, and you know, they have no problem sitting in with, with our younger members and talking to them. And when we have our meetings, we have a, you know, a large group of veterans and retirees that come to our meetings, and you know, they engage in, in, with the younger members coming in. So we have a good, uh, a good mix. Passing on the heritage. Passing on the heritage. Ty? So on the IAFF app, we've added local 522 on there so we can actually put updates on there. It's, but the challenge is getting our members to engage and they have to sign up and be part of that process. I, I am the old guy now in the station, but, so I feel like my generation, that's when computers were just starting and you have to really be on it. And what we just did as of January this year, we actually added a PIO position to our union executive board it's a non-voting position that's appointed by the president. And he's a firefighter for Sac City. By doing that, we're gonna be able to get our brand out. It's not, we have a very strict social media policy at a couple of our departments, so it's hard to get information out. But we feel like this is gonna be something that enhances the membership um, and also gives them the ability to see what we do and the politicians and, and the political action we can utilize that for, you know, for is gonna going to be a big benefit for us, but it, it's a challenge getting the members to engage. We've tried monthly updates, quarterly updates, and, uh, you know, 2,000 members, we have quarterly meetings and we, we can't fill a quorum sometimes, which 15 people, 
we have to get a truck to drive down and sign in just so we can have a meeting. And it's not that they don't care or they're not engaged, because they do. 4896 didn't help. I think the Kelly schedule, we had a little bit more involvement when people weren't working two days on, eight to eight out the gate, as we like to say. So I think there's been some issues that have caused it, but it's our job to make sure that we're engaging them and just continue to fight for it. That's all we can do. We have a brother at the mic. Yeah, Adam Van Gerpen, Los Angeles City, Local 112. Uh, we heard uh, recently at the CAL FIRE convention that, uh, that you guys have announced that there's going to be a center of excellence in uh, California. So uh, we're very excited about that. Um, as you know, you know IFS has been putting a lot of emphasis on behavioral health. Uh, we've been fortunate enough in uh, Los Angeles City, we've hired our own doctor, Dr. Froelich. Uh, our department has also hired two psychologists. And uh, we're building a, uh, a center for our members that's going to be a wellness center where they can have that behavioral health, the counseling, uh, you know, financial uh, counseling. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we sent multiple members to this uh, center of excellence, and we've had some just it's changed our lives for, uh, for the good. We've, uh, we've had really good results with that. We've been working with our management for getting them uh, uh, the time off and making sure that they're, that they're <coughs> taken care of. Um, so we're uh, also we have legislation, behavioral health legislation that we're trying to get presumptive in Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, in California. Um, so that's going to be another big push. So we're just uh, curious. We heard a little bit about this on the Cal uh, um, CPF uh, website that we're going to be announcing it. So just uh, curious what our next. Well, I don't want to, you know, uh, with an audience, not to address it tonight. We're going to. I'm going to address it in, you know, some detail. I will say okay. this. We, we have focused on behavioral health as one of the critical issues um, that we have to be able to respond to and uh, address within our membership. Um, we've been challenging ourselves to work toward uh, breaking the stigma, changing the stigma that we talk about generations, that past generations, it was like tough it up, suck it up, you can't take it, you're on the wrong job. And it unfortunately was a level of ignorance. So you know, we've focused on trying to uh, dispense with the stigma surrounding it. So members who do have emotional, potentially mental substance abuse issues will be more comfortable and confident to come forward. Uh, so there's not a you know, every area is so important, but we're spending an enormous amount of time and effort, resources uh, from peer support structures uh, to educational structures, trying to make sure that we're informing our leadership how to recognize a problem and to set up a process where members will feel that they can kind of come out of those shadows uh, to ask for help, and certainly the center of excellence is uh, kind of the pinnacle of that work. Because uh, you know, it's it's a shame to say, but the fact of the matter is that we right now have more members committing suicide than we're losing to line of duty deaths. And so this is a critical issue that this union is uh, focused on, and. Uh, the Center of Excellence has been a great success. And yes, we are actively working right now, setting the milestones and the uh, beginning the development of what will become our second center out here in, in California. Thank you. Well, I know we're getting close on time here. Uh, I want to say something about the generational issue. And if each of you would just, oh, I'm sorry, the lights. Brother at the mic. Sorry to be the last one. But no, I'm no, no, please. Uh, Dusty Renner, San Luis Obispo City Fire Department. My question is in, uh, regarding staffing. And I wanted to know what you recommend for us to achieve 4 staffing on every rig in a city that already thinks our fire department is uh, cost too much and our firemen make too much money. Well, at, at minimum, and through our standards of, at NFPA 1710, you know, it's an absolute minimum of four uh, and four. Now, we have... Uh, many cities that we actually recognize and work toward, uh, four and five on a truck, four on a, an engine, five on a heavy rescue. But if you're asking what the minimum recommendation is, our minimum recommendation is that every rig should be staffed with no less than four. And that doesn't mean assigned. That means riding. 
before. And we've been working again with NFPA uh, to incorporate it in a standard. That standard in many municipalities now has actually been codified into regulation uh, and law. And that's another part of using the political strategy to take a standard and incorporate it uh, so that it actually becomes a requirement to the department, city, municipality, uh, as opposed to just um, uh, a recommendation. So we'll close up. I want to say something about the generational issue, and it's probably showing my, uh, my generation. Uh, concern that I have is that uh, everybody here and everybody who will be watching out there, um, uh, I believe, are bold and brass, uh, aggressive uh, in your role as firefighters. Uh, but the truth is that you're also a very understated population, meaning that you don't like to have the spotlight of attention put on you. I've, I've said this as an anecdote, that um, if you're out on a tough uh, incident, and you know, and you've made a great stop or a couple of great snatches, and you get a lot of attention, or the press walks up to you, or a politician, and, starts going on about the incredible effort you just made, is almost a universal response to that. And that is? It's doing my job. Doing my job. We're just doing our job. And my point is that I think we bring that culture into our union work, unfortunately, when I say unfortunately. Uh, we, we're still learning and trying to work toward making sure that our next generations do know what your value is, what your responsibilities have been, and who brought about what they typically enjoy. That it wasn't just the state that woke up and gave them a retirement or presum presumptive legislation. It wasn't a government that gave them collective bargaining rights. Um, that all of this has been part of uh, the union's work over, over the many, many years and decades. And so I think one of the things that we're continuing this, continuously trying to teach and to utilize the communication tools, but it's to break out ourselves, to have yourselves break out and be more confident, and if you will, more aggressive in making sure that next generation in, coming in, has a, a better framework and a, and a better understanding of how this all came about. The city just didn't give them a job. The chief didn't just give them an assignment, and their captain didn't train them up, that what they're really enjoying, in large part, has been the work of, of all of our work uh, in our locals all across the uh, United States and Canada. But with that, I think our time has come to an end. We'll have to close off uh, another uh, kitchen table. We hope you'll find it of value. We really want you to give us feedback. Uh, we want to hear your views and your criticism so that we can utilize this as simply one tool to hopefully be able to, to reach out and connect uh, with the uh, 315,000 uh, men and women, sisters and brothers of this great IFF. So I want to thank the panel, Ty, thank you. Aaron, You're Amy, welcome. Rob, for your participation today and more importantly for the incredible work that you're doing, I know, every day on behalf of your members. And with that, we'll sign off and see you along the way. But more important than anything, stay safe.